I have a not deserved reputation for light rail skepticism. Okay, maybe deserved, but in today's video, I want to talk about an awesome light rail system in a northern city with lots of trains, trams, bikes, and tunnels, which means it has to be in Norway. So let's take a look at the light rail system of Bergen, Norway. I think without a doubt, one of the nicest in the world and the backbone of what can only be called a true paradise, urbanist and otherwise. Let's dive in. Bergen is a city in Western Norway with about 300,000 residents and tons of mountains and waterways. And of course, it's stunningly beautiful, which fits nicely with the stereotype of what most of people imagine for Scandinavia. The city covers a really large area, with suburbs often separated by waterways and mountains, which leads to hilarious situations like the suburb of Arna, which is separated from the city center of Bergen by a mountain. Speaking of the city center, it's almost entirely surrounded by water, with the only other side facing the aforementioned mountain. In the city center, you have the main train and bus station, which are naturally a lot nicer than those you'll find in much bigger cities elsewhere. There's actually also a surprising amount of service, with multiple daily trains to Oslo, and even fairly frequent train service to Arna under the mountain which will actually only get more frequent when the second track and tunnel parallel to the first is opened. Oh, I love Norway. Now, in many ways, Bergen reminds me of my hometown of Vancouver, albeit much smaller, from its mountains to its waterways. But while Vancouver has a huge valley filled with flat, low-lying farmland, Bergen has nothing of the sort. The landscape here is almost all hills, valleys, and mountains. You might imagine, given Bergen's modest population and its very difficult landscape, that it's maybe only served with buses and the occasional train, but you'd be wrong. And I should remind you that Norway has a history of punching above its weight with urban public transport. After all, Oslo has a really respectable metro system with an urban population of less than a million people. Meanwhile, in Vancouver, there's over two and a half million people and the system is quite a bit smaller. And that overachiever attitude isn't exclusive to Oslo. And so in the early 2000s, after decades of deliberation, Bergen decided to build its own light rail system, making it the second proper urban rail system in the country. Nice try, Tron time. The region formed an agency called Skiesch in 2007 to integrate public transit services and ticketing in anticipation of the light rail system. The first line of the system, called the Bibonen, was opened in phases starting in 2010, and Bergen has kind of been on a light rail roll ever since then extending Line 1 all the way from Bergen city center to the airport over 10 kilometers to the southwest and opening an entirely new second line. It may be helpful at this point to remind you that Los Angeles hasn't managed to get rail to its airport yet, and yet Bergen has. I imagine all of this sounds nice, but to really understand and appreciate the Bibonen, you have to actually see it. One thing I've long thought about is how wide the potential range of implementations for something as seemingly simple and standardized as a light rail can be. And in Bergen, the little things are nailed again and again and again, making this system truly wonderful. For one, the system is fast and frequent, which I care a ton about. Trams run fairly frequently late into the night, and during peak periods, they run as often as every five minutes. And they're actually really fast as well. With an average speed approaching 30 kilometers per hour, they're more similar to urban subways in speed as opposed to urban trams. All of this combines to make taking trips on the Bibonen incredibly convenient and a real joy. It's just obvious that using public transit is a good option when it's so frequent and fast. Like most modern light rail systems, Bergen's system uses 750 volt DC overhead wires and standard gauge tracks. And the actual trams themselves are lovely Variobahn units from Stadler, similar to those used on South London's Tramlink service. Stadler just make really nice stuff in my humble opinion that is a cut above the usual railway rolling stock out there. And these lovely trams aren't the only Stadler rolling stock you'll find in Bergen, which is also served by mainline trains made by, you guessed it, Stadler. Initially, all of the trams were five segment units, but since planners were forward thinking, all of the platforms on the system were pre-built to the length needed for seven segment units. And so over the years, as the system has grown, new seven segment units have been ordered and the older five segment units have been upgraded and lengthened. Better yet, these trams seem to handle the snowy weather heartily, which is very important in a climate like Bergen's. But it's not just a fancy paint job, good looks and snow friendliness. The interiors of this 100% low floor tram are actually 100% low floor, which is not actually as common as you'd expect. There are also wide aisles and nice contrasty LCD screens to tell you about the public transport system. 
and maybe my favorite touch of all, unique jingles at every single stop, kind of like in Japan to remind you where you are on the system. Integrating little musical numbers with your public transit is the kind of thought and care that rarely goes into public transit, even in this part of the world, and I love it. And that thoughtfulness extends to the design of the route. Look at any section of the line compared to light rail in many other cities and you'll see sleek and light overhead lines, something a city like Toronto could learn a lot from, where some of the overhead lines for our new light rail routes look more like what would go into a power station and less like what should power a tram. The stops also have a smart, consistent, modern design, with big protective shelters and nice next train displays. Plus, there's under-platform heating that keeps the snow and ice at bay. The design of these stops and the right-of-way is smart and minimal, and it feels half modern art museum, half transit system. I love it. That's even down to things like the font used on the signage. It's really, really nice. The actual right-of-way, or the space taken up by the tracks as the system weaves around the city, is also just artful, if I may call it that. While it's far too often the case that you see trams laid down in the middle of a gigantic street with many lanes of traffic on both sides, which feels a lot like buying a pickup truck and then slapping a hybrid badge on the back, in Bergen, streets were often extensively redesigned and frequently narrowed when the B. Bonin came along, often down to just one lane of traffic. This not only pleased anxious neighbors who saw heavy car traffic replaced with much lighter tram traffic, but which also creates a better pedestrian environment for people to get to the trams and faster speeds for the trams themselves. The design of the right-of-way is also thoughtful, making it clear to drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists where trams rule the day. All across the system you see different types of track, from green track to white track, ballasted railway-style track, and just generally different styles of pavement that make it clear where trams have priority. And which of course keep public transit speeding along, alongside lovely signal priority that makes sure trams see more green lights than red. To overview the routes, both lines start in the city centre on a shared set of tracks, but with terminating platforms one block apart. From here, the lines both run to the main train and bus station, which they both serve before diverging in different directions. Line 1 heads straight south, serving a major university and crossing the inlet that wraps around the city centre on a bridge before continuing south to serve various other neighbourhoods. Because of the chaotic street layout, the various residential neighbourhoods, and the hilly geography of Bergen, the route has a ton of different tunnels on it, as well as of course a bunch of bridges. Now Norwegians are famously very tunnel-happy people, and they're good at building them, and that's because they're very efficient. Stops are kept outside of tunnels, which keeps the tunnels affordable. And since only one tram is allowed in these short tunnels at a time, the fire requirements are much lower, again saving cost. All of this is a beautiful example of the organizations before electronics, before concrete mantra. The tunnels, which allow trams to avoid traffic of all different types, certainly help speed the route along, but so does very careful planning that often keeps trams off to the side of streets rather than in the middle of them. This reduces the number of intersections you see, particularly with cars, and makes sure trams can go very fast. There are also even short sections of pedestrian-only zones, such as at Neston Centrum. At the southern end of its route, Line 1 connects to a number of industrial and office parks, as well as a large rail yard which serves the system. This connects commuters to their jobs, and also everyone in the city to the Bergen Airport, creating a great link between Bergen and the world that doesn't require clogging up the roads. It's really cool to see an air rail link and such a nice airport connection in a city this small. I remember traveling to Salt Lake City last year, and while it is good that Salt Lake City connects its airport with light rail, the facilities there are not quite as nice. For one, the font on the signs pointing to light rail is awkwardly small, because the airport probably wants you to spend money parking your car there, and the stop is also kind of shoved off to the side of the terminal, with a kind of crappy shelter and not a lot of protection from the cold Salt Lake winters. By comparison, the Bergen light rail link at the airport has a wide platform and is situated right in front of the main terminal under a grand canopy. It's a lot better. Headed back north, Line 2 diverges from Line 1 after passing through the train and bus station. It then heads around the city centre inlet to the east before diving underground to serve the underground stop at a major hospital. Though it is surprising that Bergen isn't covered in underground tram stops given its difficult geography and the many tunnels on the system, this one is very nice, and I have to say another example of how thoughtfully planned the system was. 
From here, Line 2 cuts back to the west where it crosses Line 1 in a glorious two-level cross interchange that is surrounded by transit-oriented development and which you probably wouldn't expect in a city the size of Bergen. Better yet though, this interchange is also combined with connecting tracks that could allow for Line 1 to reroute via Line 2 should there be problems on its connection to the city centre or regular maintenance. What's even better than a big interchange? A big interchange with some really smart resiliency built in. Continuing to the south, Line 2 parallels Line 1 for some distance to the west before turning and entering what is one of the most unique elements of this rather unique system. A nearly 3 km light rail tunnel under a mountain, maybe a large hill, which allows Line 2 to connect to a suburb to the west where this line terminates. Now of course, Norway has many tunnels, and many longer than this one. But for an urban light rail system, this type of super long tunnel under a major geographic feature like this is very cool. But what's even cooler is what they did with the escape tunnel. You see, this tunnel is so long that the whole one tram at a time approach isn't practical, since it actually takes trams a fair bit of time to traverse the entire tunnel. Because of this, like many super long tunnels out there, an emergency escape and service tunnel was required. But to make best use of it, the service tunnel was certified so that pedestrians and cyclists can use it when there isn't a fire, which turns out to be most of the time. That not only makes it the longest, if not one of the longest, pedestrian and cycling exclusive tunnels in the world, but also a great connection that is part of the B. Bonin project, but just benefits everyone, even if you're not using public transit. And what's awesome is that this is far from the only cycling facility co-located with the B. Bonin. Indeed, all over the place on the network, you'll see bike paths running right alongside the tram route, and crossing it and various roadways in little tunnels and on bridges. Indeed, sometimes it seems like all of the bike and pedestrian paths that surround the b and act as a protective shield, keeping cars away from the very speedy trams. So on the whole, Bergen and the b are just remarkable. From connecting surrounding suburbs to the airport with electric rail, the copious amounts of bike and pedestrian space that let people, rather than just cars, move around the city, and the beautiful design of the rail infrastructure, alignments, stops, and tunnels. This system is one of my favorite in the world, and one of the best executed public transit systems I've seen in a city this side of a million people. I just hope that they get on with the long talked about but delayed extensions of the system, especially to the north. Thanks for watching.